Welcome back, everyone, to the second session of this policy symposium. Thank you to our dear speakers for being able to join us in this wonderful panel that is also going to follow on regional and national approaches on space sustainability. Unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, both Asanda and Hamza will not be able to join us today, both regretting that this as they were really keen to participate, but we all understand that unexpected events occur, so we'll be hoping to see them both in the May conference. This morning's session, led by Professor Stephen Freeland, had, in my view, some takeaway keywords, such as cooperation and time to action. So, to continue this vivid discussion, as a moderator of this session, we have Professor Kayuf Skrogel, President of the International Institute of Space Law, the Global Association of Space Lawyers from more than 50 countries. He served from 2014 to 2016 as Chair of the Legal Subcommittee of Caucus. He works for the European Space Agency as a special advisor for political affairs and has written or co-edited 20 books and more than 140 articles, reports and papers in the fields of space policy and law. Dear Kayuve, thank you so much for accepting this invitation to moderate this session and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Carolina, for the kind invitation and now for the kind introduction. Uh, to the session. Uh, I think we will also have an excellent uh, session, a panel, uh, which will match uh, what has been discussed and uh, what has uh, been, let's say, also developed uh, during the first morning session. I might recall um, that uh, this is the uh, space policy uh, symposium uh, as a preparatory event uh, to your uh, Portuguese uh, UN uh, Conference on Management and Sustainability of Outer Space Activities uh, in May, which will take place in Lisbon. And uh, we will be discussing the issues uh, which are arising from the policy perspective with regard to sustainability um, in space and also uh, on Earth. Uh, we have a, a panel composed of representatives of national as well as regional uh, organizations. And uh, we will try to identify the key notions of uh, sustainability and also what the actions, the key actions uh, are, and in particular, what kind of and uh, what role uh, international and regional cooperation plays uh, in this context. I might also uh, point that the um, policy brief uh, as part of our common agenda, uh, the, com uh, the policy uh, brief for all humanity, the future of outer space uh, governance uh, prepared by the General Secretariat of the United uh, Nations and dated of uh, May 2023, which is the basis uh, also for our discussions and our deliberations, because it points out where the key issues are and what and how the member states have to do and uh, have to prepare in order to reach the objectives, which we can easily uh, um, uh, circumscribe as uh, maintaining and even strengthening the sustainable use of outer space. So with that introduction, uh, I would first start uh, to give the floor uh, for introductory statements, uh, first uh, to the representative of a, uh, of a member state of uh, the United Nations, uh, Ian Grosner, uh, who is the head of the legal department uh, of the uh, Brazilian Space Agency, uh, AEB. Um, he is also, uh, very importantly, uh, the chair, most recently elected uh, of the working group uh, on the delimitation uh, of outer space uh, in the legal subcommittee of the UN Corpus, and in this function plays a, a very important role of governing uh, also outer space. He, he has many, many other uh, activities uh, at hand. And what I uh, very much like, of course, is uh, his communication skills, uh, as, as he shows uh, regularly uh, at Space Watch Global, where, where he is the moderator for the uh, Space Cafe Brazil. So uh, let's listen 
uh, to Ian uh, on his take uh, on space sustainability from a Brazilian perspective. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. On behalf of AAB, Brazilian Space Agents, I would like to thank you for inviting us to participate in this important event. Congratulations to the organizers, particularly my dear friend, Dr. Carolina Costa. Uh, space sustainability is a two-way street with benefits flowing to and from our planet. Here are the key points. First, space as a helping hand for Earth. I would like to highlight three points. First, environmental monitoring. Satellites provide vital data on climate deforestation and air and water quality. Brazil has indeed played uh, a significant role in using satellites for environmental monitoring. Here's some evidence to support this. First, pioneer programs. Brazil government has been a leader in developing space technology for environmental monitoring. Governmental environmental monitoring programs, satellite-based systems like PRODS and DETER, both created by National Institute for Space Research, INPE, are internationally recognized for their effectiveness. Second point, technological info innovation. Space exploration drives advancements in clean energy, sustainable agriculture, and resource management, all of which can potentially improve life on Earth. And third, communication and navigation. Satellites enable global communication, navigation, and position on system, which are essential for modern economy and infrastructure. For example, the Brazilian satellite SGDC, which was launched in 2017, aims to provide broadband communication to remote areas such as the Amazon region. Second, building a sustainable space future. I would like to highlight three points from the perspective of space policy regarding the sustainability of space activities. Firstly, the current national 10-year plan for space activities in Brazil, the PENAI, 2022-2031, addresses the issue of sustainable, use, uh, sustainable space use. Secondly, the current bill, which aims to regulate space activities in Brazil, has two chapters that deal with the topic, environment protection and space debris mitigation. And finally, the Brazilian government is developed regulations and licensing procedure, procedures for space activities, incorporating principles from the LTS guidelines. Regarding the number of objects launched, it's worth highlighting that Brazil does not contribute to, to the problem that exists today. In its history, it has launched less than 30 satellites. These objects were launched in compliance with good international practice, with Brazil making responsible use of space. Brazil, however, will continue to contribute to solving the concerns of sustainable space use. We understand that COPOS is the appropriate forum for discussions and searching for solutions to challenges in this area. On the other hand, the International Telecommunications Union, ITU, approved a new resolution on space sustainability during the w WRC in Dubai last year, 2023. Based on contributions sent by Brazil, the proposal aims to ensure a safe and sustainable uh, use of space, addressing challenges related to increasing the number of known geostationary satellites. This is a positive step towards uh, a future where ex space exploration can flourish alongside environmental responsibility. 
Brazil is demonstrating its leadership in this critical area by taking a proactive stance. ITU, UN, OSA, and COPOS play crucial roles in fostering international cooperation to address the long-term sustainability of space activities. By combining their expertise and resources, these organizations can play a leading role in shaping a sustainable future for space exploration and ensuring a safe and healthy environmental environment for space activities for generations to come. AAB, Brazilian Space Agency, is committed to engage in international initiatives to guarantee a sustainable future for space. And finally, I would like to highlight challenges and opportunities in international cooperation. Global cooperation is essential for developing responsible regulations and practice for space sustainability. The Sabiamar project perfectly illustrates how regional cooperation can benefit both countries, Brazil and Argentina, and contributes to broader goal of space sustainability. Here's a breakdown of the project significance. Regional collaboration, Brazil and Argentina collaborating strengths their space and scientific research capabilities in South America. Focus on Earth observation, Sabiamar satellites will provide valuable data on South America oceans and coastlines, aiding in environmental monitoring, resource management, and disaster response. And finally, sustainability in action. Following best practice for sustainable space activity sets, a positive example for future space endeavors. The Sabiamar offers Brazil and Argentina a platform to demonstrate their commitment to sustainable space activities and set a positive example for future endeavors. This project aligns perfect, perfectly with our discussion about the importance of international collaboration for space sustainability. It's worth mentioning that Brazil and China have announced their plans to collaborate on Cyber 6 which will be the lastest, latest satellite in the China-Brazil Earth Resource Satellite Program. This partnership highlights their commitment to working together on Earth observation missions and signif signifies the continuation of their long-running collaboration. In conclusion, Mr. Chair, space sustainability is a critical challenge for ensuring responsible space exploration and the well-being of Earth. We can build a future where space and Earth thrive together through international cooperation, cooperation, research and development and education. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Ian, for, for this uh, fascinating insight uh, in Brazil's commitment and also contribution to uh, space sustainability. Um, I found particularly uh, interesting your view uh, on the one hand, space sustainability or assuring sustainability on Earth through space, and then assuring uh, sustainability in space. And, and your commitment to international cooperation in this field is uh, absolutely noted. And uh, what I found uh, particularly interesting also is that not only um, UN Corpus has been mentioned by you, but also ITU, another international organization uh, which is regulating space activities in a, in a very solid way, uh, I would say. I, I think in the discussion we will we will return to these points and we very well noted uh, the Brazilian contributions uh, to this. Let me now turn to our uh, representatives uh, of the uh, international regional organizations. Uh, first, uh, Rodolf um, Munoz um, uh, from the European uh, Commission. Uh, Rodolf is uh, a very experienced international lawyer, having worked uh, and having had a distinguished career in, in a number of international organizations and now works for quite some time in the European Commission. 
uh, now in the uh, Directorate General uh, for uh, uh, Defense Industry and Space. And, and I, I think I can say uh, he is the driving force uh, for STM uh, and uh, SSA in the European Union. And you see it also from his backdrop uh, that uh, these are the uh, areas uh, where, where he already made significant contributions, not only to European, but also to international uh, activities. So, Rolf, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, uh, first, uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, and I would like to thank as well, uh, of course, uh, the Portuguese uh, Space Agency and the Office of uh, Out of Space Affairs for organizing this uh, conference and as well for inviting the European Commission. Thank you very much. I think, the, I mean, uh, of course, the importance of uh, developing sustainability in space is known by all of you. Uh, I mean, the role of uh, space assets in economic growth, but as well in the protection of uh, our planet uh, through our, at the EU level, through Copernicus, for example, or as well uh, on telecommunication with Galileo is very important. And the importance has been underlined with a new regulation on Iris Square, where you have for the first time in the EU an obligation to develop uh, some aspect related to sustainability and safety. What I would like to do is, uh, with the, the, the five minutes that I have, is uh, to, to do three points. First, what we have in mind when we talk about space sustainability, then the actions which have been done at the EU level, uh, and finally, uh, what could be the role of uh, regional or, and international cooperation, because I think they need to go hands to hands. So here, uh, the first point regarding uh, space sustainability for us, this is really how human activities have an effect on the space environment. This is really the, the idea behind. But of course, and the, the idea is of course to minimize this effect and to ensure that we will still have access to space. But I think uh, there are, I mean, uh, safety and sustainability are two faces of the same coin in, this, in a way, because of course you need as well to develop safety in order not to produce additional debris. So this is uh, very important for us. They really need to go hands to hands. Uh, this is uh, really an important point. So here uh, on this point, what I would like to, to do now is my, on my second point is what we have done. So uh, in 2022, uh, we have adopted a joint STM communication with, uh, so it's a joint communication, meaning with the commission and the high representative. And in this communication, we have 10 actions in order to, to work uh, on that uh, specific issue. And I think it's important to underline that in this communication, uh, you have two titles of this communication. The first one is the development of the EU approach, which is, uh, of course, something important. Why? Because we need to work with our member states of the EU. We need to discuss with them and to see what is the EU approach. Uh, the, the Commission will never define alone this. But as well, uh, the second part is perhaps more uh, pertinent for uh, this presentation today is really the second title is an EU contribution to a global challenge. So this is very important. This challenge is global, meaning that the EU, its member states, will never ever manage to solve the issue. It has to go through uh, a cooperation uh, between uh, the different entities and uh, as well uh, countries. In this communication, you had uh, 10 actions. Uh, we have developed most of them. Uh, it has been announced officially by our uh, commissioner that we will uh, very soon adopt uh, what we call the EU space law, where you have a specific uh, chapter dealing about safety and sustainability in space. So we really would like to indeed develop requirements at the EU level regarding safety and sustainability. 
But what you have as well in this uh, future proposal that I cannot display today because it has not been, of course, yet published, is as well another element which is the development not only of requirements, meaning it's compulsory to follow them, but as well to develop what we call EU space label in order to promote the development of even more protection of sustainability, but on a non-compulsory way. So meaning that why not doing more uh, and trying to do more than what is required? So this uh, STM communication is really uh, the uh, basis of all the actions that we have developed, Commission and HR, in uh, that field. Now, uh, and I'm a bit late, I'm sorry, what I would like to do is uh, to do the uh, for the role. I think it's very important, of course, the work at the copious level is important and uh, more than important, of course, it needs to continue. It has produced extraordinary uh, results and it needs to continue. This is the only way we need to work together there. However, perhaps at the operational level, uh, there may, might be some need to develop some exchanges. And there, basically, uh, the idea is at the EU level, we have uh, at the operational level, the EU SST partnership, uh, which deliver uh, collision avoidance to uh, more than 450 uh, satellites uh, at the moment from the EU and from the non-EU as well. And of course, the idea is for the EU is not to uh, deliver these services to all the satellites in the world. Of course, we, we want to take uh, I mean, part of the burden, but we don't plan to take the overall burden generated with the development of space debris and sustainability. So the idea that we develop in this communication is the fact that it would be great if indeed uh, you could end up at the operational level to have more cooperation between the regional entities uh, and, fe and federate uh, this uh, cooperation in order just, I mean, uh, what could be the, this cooperation? Well, this cooperation, the sky is the limit, depend of the willingness of the partners. It could be, of course, uh, just the possibility to have a, a contact uh, when you have very uh, when you have a high interest event, meaning high risk of collision, or it could be as well to exchange uh, more if uh, it's possible. So I would like to conclude here by saying that uh, we need to act. We need to act, of course, at the international level. But it would be good as well if we could start really cooperate at the operational level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rodolf, for this uh, very interesting insight. Uh, I, I would call it in the machine room uh, of uh, how the European Commission is uh, creating um, uh, regulation and, and, and also international initiatives uh, for that purpose uh, of uh, space traffic management. Uh, which, of course, is of, of highest relevance uh, for the topic we are currently discussing. And uh, I think uh, there are a number of points uh, which we will also take up uh, in the discussion uh, which will follow. Now, the presentation by Thomas Weissenberg, our last speaker uh, in this session. Uh, Thomas is uh, with the European uh, Space Agency, uh, the International Relations uh, Department, and is responsible for multilateral uh, affairs. Uh, he has a distinguished career uh, in DLR, the German Aerospace Center, where he was the head of uh, international relations and shaped also the uh, uh, space cooperation agenda uh, of, of DLR uh, as a whole. So, Thomas, um, happy to hear your take uh, on ESA's uh, understanding of uh, space sustainability and the international activities and initiatives it's uh, taken up. Okay, Uwe, thank you very much. That's very kind. Uh, first of all, a great thank you to uh, UNOSA and um, to the Portuguese Space Agency for providing uh, ESA the opportunity to contribute uh, to this uh, symposium. And uh, ESA is extremely 
yeah, uh, keen to contribute uh, as it is in, in our genes to implement measures uh, supporting a sustainable behavior and to lead by good example within the European space sector. At this point, it might be worthwhile noting that ESA is not a political organization. So we, um, we do not have a mandate and our member states like Portugal and many others, uh, they wouldn't allow us to um, to act, let's say, as a regulator. These are other entities uh, like the national governments or the European Commission. Um, but nevertheless, um, we are a space operator and uh, we, um, we have a self-interest in, in this whole topic. And um, therefore, I would like to um, yeah, to give you a brief overview on um, what has been done at ESA in the recent uh, years, uh, we got uh, by our member states uh, the mandate to take several large steps in further implementing a sustainable policy for our programs and for our projects. For example, ESA's Clean Space Initiative or uh, the ESA Zero Debris Approach or the ESA Green Agenda. And I will provide you with the um, Brief overview. Um, actually, I, I asked Asanda if I could get her five minutes and uh, she, she agreed. So please forgive me if I talk a little bit longer. Um, I would like to um, yeah, to, to focus on, on ESA's activities uh, regarding sustainability from three different angles. The first one being ESA as an operator of spacecrafts. Uh, here we implement best possible measures to be a responsible space actor. Second angle will be ESA serving our member states. Uh, we support our member states with knowledge and expertise in implementing measures for broadening sustainability in their space activities. And then as a last angle, ESA is a green space agency. We uh, just recently implemented uh, ESA's Green Agenda, which is a dedicated long-term program to reduce ESA's greenhouse gas emissions, but which also spreads into our programs, into our core uh, space activities. And this has a strong uh, sustainability component as well. Starting with the first angle, ESA as an operator. Already in 2012, ESA's Clean Space Initiative was set up to consider the environmental impact of the entire life cycle of our space missions. These clean space activities fall into three main areas. Eco-design, which means the reducing of environmental impacts and fostering green technologies. Uh, second, end of life management which means minimizing the production of further space debris. And third, in-orbit servicing and active debris removal, uh, which means removing a spacecraft from orbit and demonstrating in-orbit servicing of spacecrafts. And of course, developing the respective technologies for this. Numerous studies and uh, technology developments were funded to learn about the necessary next steps for example, the, the Green Set uh, study looked into the eco design of a satellite from the beginning, for, from phase zero uh, till, um, till the end of lifetime for the maximum reduction of its environmental impact. We uh, investigated or we launched studies on the impact of launches, which have a, uh, let's say, a sustainable impact uh, as well. We um, launched studies simulating uh, satellite collisions to better forecast space debris or modeling the risk of uh, breakups of large satellites. We also had a study called the Megaco study, which sought to understand the complexity of mega constellations with a focus on collision avoidance and dealing with satellites that have reached the end of their lives. So, and then Beside these dozens of studies, um, we also uh, implemented dedicated missions and technology developments such as uh, ADRIOS, which is an active debris removal in orbit servicing project, which aims to establish a new market for in orbit servicing of spacecraft. We also launched the Clear Space One mission, the first mission to remove an item of space debris from orbit. 
Based on the findings of these studies and in view of the latest developments in space, ESA committed itself to set um, to a set of much more ambitious uh, space debris requirements by 2030. The zero debris approach that includes, among others, mandatory removal action in case of failed disposal. As part of this zero debris approach, ESA has updated its debris mitigation requirements and standards that govern how the agency's missions are designed, built, flown and disposed of, but also setting the rules for any company or institution that works with ESA on its missions. This applies to European space industry, which uh, participates in our missions, but also to our international partners when we collaborate uh, on an international level. The zero debris approach comes with eight recommendations that will be implemented step by step so that ESA reaches a zero debris status of its missions by 2030. These eight recommendations are uh, a, guarantees, a guaranteed successful disposal, uh, second, improve orbital clearance, which means any satellite or rocket body in LEO should not remain in orbit longer than five years after its end of life. Third, avoid in orbit collisions, which means improved collision avoidance strategies using automation, traffic coordination, communication protocols, and more are needed and being developed. Fourth, avoid internal breakups. The technology de development, for example, in the area of robust uh, passivation techniques. Fifth, uh, prevent international uh, intentional release of space debris. This applies, for example, for protective covers, lens caps, or rocket fairings. Six, uh, improve on ground risk assessment. Seven, guarantee dark and quiet skies. Another very important topic for for all of us, which is part of this sustainability um, discussion as well. And eighth, extend uh, scope of measures beyond uh, the protected regions, i.e. not only focusing on LEO, uh, but also, for example, on lunar orbits and the ones used by global navigation satellite systems. So all these internal measures are not an idealistic concept, but an absolute necessity for the future of space activity of all nations. A few words on the second angle, ESA serving its member states. Uh, we support them with knowledge and expertise. This applies, for example, to legal advice when formulating a national space law or regulations transmitting the LTS guidelines into national law. This applies also for technical and operational expertise when operating national spacecraft or implementing respective procedures. Likewise, ESA contributes with its expertise uh, in international fora or groups that develop standards and guidelines, such as ISO, IADC, or all the working groups at COPUS level. The ultimate goal is to implement measures for broadening sustainability, not only in our own missions, but to encourage European and international partners as well. Only a broad engagement of like-minded space actors and a collaborative effort can allow the zero debris approach to accomplish its goal of guaranteeing a sustainable use of Earth orbits. In this regard, ESA is currently facilitating the production of the zero debris technical booklet. It will contain a comprehensive list of needs, technical solutions and contributions crowdsourced through the zero debris community. On the more global scale, ESA has facilitated the drafting of the Zero Debris Charter together with, with dozens of proactive entities worldwide from all sizes and types, large operators, major satellite manufacturers, space agencies, international governmental organizations, startup companies, non-governmental organizations, universities, insurance providers. The result is a daring vision on space debris mitigation and remediation, combining the highest level of ambition with the necessary pragmatism. The Charter is fully in line with applicable law and practices 
and is composed of five environmentally driven measures, uh, measurable targets covering critical needs. The Zero Debris Charter is a simple document of the space community, by the space community and for the space community. Any entity willing to contribute is encouraged to register its intent and to sign the Charter. One last word on ESA's Green Agenda, which is the third angle I would like to, to have a brief look on. Um, this ESA Green Agenda is an even more encompassing angle. Um, it was adapted at uh, the last ministerial conference and aims at reducing ESA's environmental footprint at all levels of our activities and to foster its contribution to the sustainable development of our society. Hence, it is about the reduction of ESA's greenhouse gas emissions, about the preservation of biodiversity, human health, and about resource scarcity, which then closes the circle to space debris and um, uh, orbit um, safe again. To achieve these targets, the ESA Green Agenda contains actions in five different areas, a sustainable strategy for ESA's space programs and activities, a facility and asset management, life cycle assessment, eco-design, research and development, uh, it also includes the procurement and our complete supply chain, and it affects also our culture and ways of working. So I'm not going to elaborate um, on all these measures. However, you see that sustainability is an encompassing concept for ESA, not only in space, but on ground as well. And we apply these targets to our missions and projects, but also to our suppliers and industrial as well as international partners. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussion we will have now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Thomas, for this detailed uh, presentation full of concrete examples of, of how to tackle uh, sustainability. Um, let's, let's do a few uh, rounds of uh, looking into specific uh, activities and, um, and measures. Um, we, we have been talking already about things like space traffic management, but uh, we should not lose sight that, first of all, uh, I think we have to deal with uh, space debris. Uh, Thomas, you mentioned um, uh, respective activities uh, by, by ESA, but I would also now like uh, to ask uh, Ian and uh, Rodolf, uh, what do you think, uh, what still has to be done uh, with regard to space debris mitigation or even removal, and, and what are the uh, the international fora uh, where this should be discussed uh, to, exist, to which extent. Uh, Ian, maybe you would take it first. Thank you, Kayuvi. Um, yes, as I, as I said, uh, in Brazil, uh, we have right now a bill uh, passing through our uh, parliament. And this bill uh, is... Um, it's tried to regulate space um, uh, space system in Brazil, and uh, one chapter deals exactly with space debris mitigation. Uh, in this context, uh, when this bill uh, in the future uh, turns a law here, a national law in Brazil, uh, as we said. In Brazil, will be um, mandatory for all space um, uh, launches in Brazil uh, to um, uh, to follow what the international standards for space debris mitigations um, says. For, for us in Brazil, international cooperation in this in this area is the key. Of course, um, we 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 don't, and we and another state in the in the world can do this alone. So we have to to have international cooperation in this area. And for space debris, I think uh, the best forum uh, is UNOSA, uh, the COPUS. And and the the committee as as the as this area for 
uh, to talk about this and try to, to understand the problem and how to resolve it. Thank you very much, Ian. Rodolf? Yeah, so here uh, I would like to, to, to join what uh, Jan said. Of course, uh, it is uh, of the utmost importance to go on the work within UNOSA and CUPOAS. So this is clear. Uh, I think uh, on the side of uh, mitigation and remediation, uh, on the side of the, the mitigation, I think it's uh, today where we can act more quickly, uh, personally. Uh, it's uh, technically feasible. Of course, everything has a cost, but it's technically feasible. Uh, don't get me wrong, eh? remediation is very important and has to go on. Uh, all the technical development, which were mentioned before, are very important. But you have something in between, uh, which is once again the more the operational part uh, with the uh, collision avoidance, uh, which is in between. And this as well is uh, very important according to us. It's where we need today to uh, develop really direct links with the other countries, the other regions. Of course, whatever we will develop at the EU level, we will will be done within the competence of the EU. Huh? This is uh, very important, I need to, to say it, because uh, the Commission doesn't have the competence for everything. I mean, member states, of course, of the EU re remain in charge huh, of many, many aspects. But there, uh, to your answer, so to your question, my answer would be uh, mitigation. I think we, we have a quick win. Uh, remediation, we still need to go on with research, but OK. but. Above all, we need to see how operationally we could uh, perhaps work uh, hands to hands. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rodolf. Uh, Thomas, you, you mentioned uh, debris remediation, debris removal. Uh, ESA is a pioneer in that. Uh, can, you, can you elaborate uh, a little bit on that and, and where uh, this might also uh, be, uh, let's say, a topic um, for international uh, coordination and consideration. Yeah, thank you, uh, Kai Uwe. I, I, I will answer your question. Um, first, I, I would um, love to um, to agree what what Ian and uh, Rudolf uh, just uh, mentioned. Um, first and foremost, it's um, the task of national regulators uh, to to implement. Um, measures that prevent um, yeah, a further destruction of, um, of our orbits, of, um, of um, the way how we would like uh, to use um, or, yeah, space in 50 years, in 100 years and in 200 years. So it's, it's action to do now and, and the easiest way is to do it on a national level. Um, then, of course, it is <laughs> To, to my humble opinion, uh, UN, uh, UN COPUS, which is the right forum to work on these um, aspects on, on, on an international level. Uh, we are all aware that um, in, in recent years it was a little bit more difficult uh, due to geopolitical um, yeah, uh, constellations uh, to find uh, consensus. Uh, at COPUS level, uh, but still, this is the forum where uh, COPUS member states exchange not only ideas, but also agree. And um, despite all the, yeah, the, the little challenges or the bigger challenges in recent years, uh, COPUS is still capable of uh, agreeing on, uh, for example, the LTS guidelines. And in these LTS guidelines, they are they are a wonderful instrument. These are not binding rules. That's uh, um, probably a little bit the, um, yeah, it would be nice to, to, to work on, on binding rules, uh, but that's uh, simply currently not, um, not possible. Uh, nevertheless, um, this is the place to discuss uh, international regimes uh, for commonly accepted rules. And, <laughs> It shouldn't be that difficult because everyone who loves space must love clean space. 
it, it's so simple and and all spacefaring nations and and especially the uh, the newcomers and, and we have the last 10 years an enormous amount of uh, new space actors they um, they need a clean space environment to uh, to use space as we did the the old ones uh, the last 50 years and we were um, the the nations and, and the regions that polluted uh, orbit so now we we adopted we we learned uh, that this wasn't uh, the smartest way um, but but it's also a fact that um, well, we we have to consider the spacefaring nations, the established ones, of how to support um, the newcomers, um, the emerging space agencies. I think that's uh, an important aspect, and and most um, yeah established uh, space agencies they think in that way that uh, that they launch little programs supporting uh, their neighbors and and uh, newer ones. Um, then you asked about um, remediation of, um, yeah, uh, please, Kai Uwe, could, could you repeat your question again? No, no, you, you have uh, very well responded uh, to, yeah. to my question already. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Thomas, uh, for that. And, and in particular, mentioning the burden sharing, the equitable burden sharing, uh, which is, I think, uh, a very important element of, of international uh, cooperation. And, and these are, uh, Carolina, uh, some of the takeaways, uh, I think we also can uh, present then to the, to the plenary uh, in May. I would also like to, to respond uh, to uh, what the three of you said about UN COPUOS as, as the main forum for uh, international coordination and also lawmaking. Um, uh, I am pleased that uh, uh, UN COPUOS and the legal subcommittee also in the field like space traffic management uh, is regarded as an appropriate uh, forum and uh, this uh, in particular because it was at my time as uh, chair of the legal subcommittee when space traffic management was established as an agenda item as an offer to the member states to to just use it as the place to discuss and as we heard from uh, Rodolf and, and and also from Ian and and uh, Thomas there are already ideas of how to handle that in an international coordinated way. I am now told uh, by Carolina that uh, our fourth panelist, um, Emmanuel Bordoncle, is uh, on a different line. He had uh, trouble with, with um, getting into teams, uh, but, but he can hear us and, and he can now make a, make a short statement. Uh, Emmanuel is uh, dealing with uh, sustainability and regulation in the uh, Directorate General uh, for the uh, Enterprises uh, as an uh, organization of the French uh, Ministry for Economy and Finances. And already before, uh, he was working in that field, um, in the space sustainability field, when he was with the Foreign Ministry uh, of uh, France. Emmanuel, can you hear us and can you give a short uh, introduction to the French approach to space sustainability? First of all, um, I'm very, very sorry uh, for being late and for these uh, connection uh, issues. Um, uh, I, I was following your, your, your debate and uh, I'm deeply sorry that I, I can join you uh, since the, the beginning. Um, just to, to, to say a quick few words about the French policy and mainly the, the, the French um, regulatory framework uh, dedicated to uh, space sustainability. Um, maybe a general um, overview about uh, the, the, the French uh, legis legislation. Um, as you know, the, the French Space Operation Act of uh, 2008 uh, supplemented by several decrees and a technical regulation uh, established the legal framework for space activities in France. Um, into that uh, framework, there is uh, the idea of this framework. It's um, to set up a process for the authorization and supervision of the space activities in, on French operator in accordance with the international treaty and uh, particularly the, the 1967 treaty. 
this process allows French to manage uh, its liability in connection with this space activity. Um, this uh, Space Operation Act regulates the authorization of all space operations performed by French operators and taking into account of the long-term development of space activities. Um, in particular, this question is addressed uh, through the uh, technical regulation. Uh, this technical regulation gave um, due consideration to the space debris mitigation guidelines, but also um, uh, about the uh, recommended practice and the voluntary guidelines uh, put forward by the uh, Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee and also uh, the Committee on, on Space Research. Um, to, to, to say a few words about uh, how it works, um, the, the technical regulation, uh, which is currently updating uh, in France and a new version, uh, an update of the technical regulation, uh, will be released at the beginning of uh, April or May in, in one or two months. But the idea uh, stays uh, the same. This technical regulation requires for all space operation to uh, limit the number of fragments, um, to limit the risk to person and property on the ground during the launch and re-entry of space object, limit the risk to uh, public health and uh, to the environment, and be compliant with nuclear, uh, nuclear safety requirements, for example. Um, operators under the, the French law uh, have uh, to uh, carry out an environmental impact assessment and uh, as a study for all space operations and uh, had to implement a plan to manage risk and to ensure the safety of person, property, public health and environment. Uh, the authorization process and the assessment of compliance with technical regulation provide assurance that uh, operators have the means, resources, skills, and the organization necessary to perform the operation in compliance with uh, this space act. It also allows the competent uh, authorities to check ongoing compliance throughout the operational life of the space object um, uh, and uh, as I was saying in just a, a few moments, uh, this regulation is regularly uh, updated. We also uh, have some um, um, way to, to, to promote the, the sharing of orbital information on space subjects, uh, mainly uh, through uh, international fora. Um, I can, for example, I can uh, speak about um, sorry, I can speak about the um, uh, the EU, EU SST um, program. Uh, our space agency, our ZNES, uh, is deeply involved uh, into um, this uh, European program. Uh, we are also uh, actively participate to uh, ISO and the CSS uh, forum which uh, carry out important work uh, to develop shared standards and norms. Uh, and we think in this matter, uh, cooper international cooperation is um, essential and uh, necessary to, 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 to have um, comprehensive, uh, we talk about space traffic management um, and this matter uh, should be addressed at an international level. At an international level. Uh, we also develop a um, rich ecosystem of governmental entities and private actors with the capability to, to detect, measure, and catalog the orbital population. It's also important uh, with the technical, uh, with the legal framework, and the regulatory framework to, to, to promote practice um, in this field. Um, Maybe uh, I can develop some of uh, this point, uh, maybe about uh, how we um, participate to space debris monitoring information or about uh, the importance of uh, the registration of space subject, but I, I will let you uh, react to what I said, uh, just maybe to, to, 
to briefly uh, conclude this uh, this uh, preliminary statement, um, just to say that uh, we 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 share the concerns about uh, that space has become a fashioning environment with an increase in both risk and threats and new changes for safety and security of space activities. Um, in, in this matter, giving the dependency of our society and space assets, um, ensuring the safety and security of space activities is a priority for all of us. And front believes that the action of international community should be based on several principles. And uh, we talk about uh, copios. We also can talk about the, uh, the respect of the Charter of the United Nations, um, the necessity that the response must be primarily uh, be effective, pragmatic, to deliver concrete and immediately uh, measurable benefits. Um, and we also think that uh, a new challenge for the international community will be to address the um, environmental aspects on Earth and not only in the uh, space. So I will conclude uh, on this world. Thank you, thank you all. And I also want to, to thank, thank you, especially the, the space agency, the Portuguese space agency, for the for the meeting and for the invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. Can you mute? Thank you. Um, so uh, we we have we have heard. Uh, do you also hear an echo? Emmanuel, can you can you either mute or now it's working? Good, thank you. Now, uh, this is also an interesting point uh, made by Emmanuel. I would say, Carolina, uh, this uh, sustainability on Earth, uh, which is a sustainable space sector, uh, not only caring about uh, sustainability in outer space, but also how we manage uh, our activities on Earth. Uh, Thomas has also mentioned that. Uh, with uh, uh, the green agenda uh, of ESA, for example. We have uh, ho hopefully time uh, for, for one last round. Uh, and uh, that last round, I would uh, put under the following question. Um, we have been talking about uh, mainly governmental activities. But uh, when we look into the policy brief uh, by the uh, Secretary General, also, the private sector activities are expressly uh, mentioned, and, and they are mentioned in a way that uh, we have to understand and also to see how governmental and private sector activities can go together. Uh, will it be just a top-down regulation? Will it be also that the private sector is uh, taking initiatives? Where do they meet? Will it be carrot and sticks? Or will it be only carrots? Will it be only sticks? Um, maybe uh, each of you can, at the end uh, of, of, of uh, our discussion now, um, say a few words and, and a few ideas, share a few ideas how your respective organizations see this nexus, governmental and private activities and regulations. Let's start with Ian, please. Thank you, Kayuvi. Um, yes, yeah, so private sector right now in space um, activities, it's getting bigger and more important every day. So, of course, uh, we in Brazil, in Brazilian space agents, we are together with the, the private companies. Uh, we, our policies, our um, policies in space sectors uh, are try to developing this important sector, but of course we, we have to remember Outer Space Treaty and the responsibility of the states, right? So, of course, uh, one private company in Brazil um, will launch or will send uh, uh, space for uh, uh, space objects into space. So, it's important to follow our regulations here because in Brazil, Brazilian Space Agency is the the main um, uh, uh, body in the state responsible to um, uh, to develop the regulations for private space sector, and 
we try to when when we we dealing with the the um, the regulations here in space sector we try to put in our regulations in in brazilian aab regulations um, the importance to follow the international standards especially for preserve um, uh, the 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 long term sustainability for space activities right so for us of course it, it's 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 it could be the challenge as i can say because um we, we we need to to improve our private sector but in the other hand we have to follow these international standards and these international standards are getting more um for some companies uh, hard to 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 follow so and we we need to to find the balance and Thomas said very well, uh, um, the developed countries in the past uh, caused this problem that we have right now, the, the, this super uh, um, big and, and pollution on space. But of course, uh, everyone now has to solve the problem and Brazil is part to the, the, the solutions to solve this problem. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Ian. Um, Emmanuel, could you be next? Yes, um, I'm on mute. I hope uh, you, you hear me well. Um, we, on the French side, uh, we, we think it's a very, very important matter. And we, we need to, to, to think about the, the, the way to better involve the private uh, sector and private actors. Uh, in, in our uh, at a national level, uh, we always uh, consult and discuss, and we have uh, some permanent uh, fora to 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 exchange with the private actors and to to think how uh, to to update our national uh, regulation or to, um, um, to to for private sector to to make suggestions and comment and. We have this uh, habit to, to, to work hand by hand um, in, within the, the, the national framework uh, with the private sector. But uh, we, we see at the international level, it's, it's much difficult to, to, to involve private actors. But it's a necessity. Uh, we, 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 we say that uh, the, this. Um, this issue, it's a, is a, an international issue. Uh, so we, we have to have uh, all the stakeholders uh, around the table and all the stakeholders uh, means the private sector too. So uh, uh, just to give an example, we, we, we know that the, uh, within the copios, it's uh, sometimes difficult to uh, involve a private uh, sector, but in the same time, when we see uh, how much the uh, working group on uh, long-term sustainability guidelines is important and uh, succeed to, 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 to deliver uh, important guidelines, we implant them uh, on a national level. It, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's too bad that we uh, can have in Vienna uh, the private sector with us uh, around the table. So um, we, we think it's, it's a, it will be a challenge for the, for the next years. And if I think about the, the, the new states uh, who are um, uh, creating space activity and space, uh, new space activities, uh, they make that through uh, private actors and we, we, we have to, to, to involve at the international level within the government, also is the international organization. Um, it, it's important to, to have them around the table. So uh, we, we definitely support uh, a better involvement of the private sector in the international discussion on this matter. Thank you very much for this take on the question. Rodolf, please. <clears throat> so here, I think what, what we have in mind at the EU level is first to involve, second to foster, three to uh, incentivize and four to promote. I would explain. 
So first, to involve uh, the idea is when I was talking about uh, the future EU space law, we had a, a fully transparent process where we involve all the companies, we received more than uh, 400 uh, comments coming from EU and non-EU companies. All of them were very valuable, and I would like to, to really to, to insist on that. And uh, this is very important. Why? Because we are not regulating, uh, having in mind to kill the sector. And this has, has been said uh, by the previous speakers. Huh? Of course, when you have uh, an action uh, as a regulator, it has consequences uh, for companies. So we need to work hands to hands with them. Then uh, second to foster, why foster what? Foster research. Because basically all the new technological breakout, breakthrough, sorry, will come from industry. We need to foster that. We need to see where we are missing things on the remediation, on dark and quiet sky, or even on mitigation, of course. So we need to promote this research uh, done at, uh, I mean, uh, at the private level. Then incentivize. Uh, this is why we have in mind to develop this uh, European uh, safe label. Uh, in order to incentivize the use of uh, non-binding measures today. As you, you, all of you recall, I mean, uh, there are a lot of non-binding, a lot of standards, but this has a cost. So we need to find a way to incentivize the use of this very good material that we have here. But companies, if they decide to follow them, of course, they will have additional costs. Why they will do it? And finally, to promote, uh, indeed, uh, and this is very important, the EU is doing its best in order to promote and help uh, not only, of course, the EU countries, but the others. And we offer uh, the possibility to train, to explain. It's why we have as well open the uh, EU SST partnership to uh, non-EU uh, companies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rodolf. And now, finally, uh, Thomas. Thank you very much, Kai-Uwe. Um, two, two aspects I, I would like to, to focus on. First one, operations. Um, Emmanuel and, um, and also Rudolf mentioned that um, before, when we talk about uh, the involvement of uh, the private sector into this um, whole process of making our space activities more sustainable. Uh, in an operational point of view, it's difficult for, for private companies, for large satellite operators like SpaceX or um, Utelsat or whomever, um, it's difficult to, to cope with all the other um, spacecraft operators because everyone uses probably a different protocol, a different uh, communication line whatsoever. I remember when SpaceX um, had sent up uh, its first few hundred satellites, um, our colleagues in Darmstadt at, at the European Space Operations Center, they, uh, they discovered that um, we were close to, um, uh, to a collision with one of the um, uh, SpaceX uh, satellites and uh, we we had to call them and there was no established uh, communication line between ESA and uh, SpaceX. So it took far too long. In the end, everything went well. But um, we, we learned two things. The first one, uh, immediately after that, uh, such a, a standard communication line between SpaceX and uh, ESA was established. And, and the reason for that is simply that SpaceX and of course ESA, both sides have a, a very strong self-interest that uh, no collision happens. But now think for, from a um, private company point of view, it's, it's really difficult to cope with all the other different entities and, and, and there will be more governmental actors uh, who, who have uh, large constellations, uh, private uh, companies. And um, I, I think purely from an economic point of view, it would be good to have some kind of authority like we have it for the aviation um, sector uh, to have um, 
it, it could also be um, a, a private company uh, providing such a service, but um, with the mandate of all the governments, um, something like a, a worldwide uh, authority for for space uh, safety. Uh, I'm, it, it's it's probably too much. It's it's a little bit of of a dream, but um, at least we we need these um, uh, protocols and uh, to, to to have fast communication in case of of something uh, might happen. Um, that's the first point, and then a little bit more in uh, a general perspective concerning a top-down approach or how um, how governmental agencies like ESA uh, can can handle this topic of sustainability with the private sector. Um, I think to a, to a certain extent it will be a top-down approach and I think it will be good for the private sector as well because then um, all private actors, at least in a certain region, um, they have to cope with the same rules and, and ESA will, um, and, and we, we already do, we, we implement our space, mit or space debris mitigation rules in our supply chains. When, when uh, a private company applies for a contract, they have to cope with our rules. And that's a, a very simple approach uh, to, uh, to the benefit of all. So in, in this regard, uh, these, I, I would make this uh, distinction be between the, the two aspects. Thank you. Thank you very much, also Thomas. So we made that round and I hope that this was also an interesting aspect uh, which could go then uh, to the uh, May uh, uh, workshop. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to thank the uh, speakers uh, in the panel uh, again with the hope that this was a useful uh, extension of the first session uh, this morning, uh, where, where you, Carolina, uh, the organizers uh, have been uh, able to get and to now assemble uh, a good uh, set of recommendations and also observations on how to proceed uh, in the near future and how then uh, also to fulfill the agenda. Uh, which we have uh, before us. Thank you very much to the speakers and thank you very much to the organizers and I hand back to Carolina. Thank you so much, dear speakers, for excellently sharing your great hands-on experience and your ideas on how to handle the sustainability of outer space in the near future. And thank you, Kayuva, for your keen leadership of the session. Thank you all so much, dear friends. With this wonderful panel, we conclude the sessions on regional and national approaches on space sustainability and the first day of the policy symposium. I believe that today we had a unique, diverse and detailed overview on the many ways to address space sustainability, the concerns it raises, the strategies that are being put in place, the great takeaways of burden sharing and sustainability, not only on space, but also in Earth, and how this is already truly embedded in public policies, hand in hand with the private operators, but without letting go the state's liability and state's responsibility in regulating the national activities. So it's just time to take the next step. And to help in that direction, tomorrow we'll be having two sessions on space debris. One starting at 8 UTC, moderated by Dr. Yuma Ashwaram from ISRO, and the other starting at 12 UTC, moderated by Nicholas Hedman, Vice Chair of COSPAR. So let me thank again all the speakers and the moderator for your so kind participation and see you all in the sessions tomorrow. Have a nice morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you might be. Bye-bye. Thank you.